surprised to see this much of a crowd here. But um, I, I hope I won't disappear with you. Um, so Gobekli Tepe, I'm sure all of you have heard about it. Uh, a lot has been written about the site. They call it the birthplace of religion, or some refer to it as uh, the Turkish Stonehenge. It has been declared the UNESCO World Heritage Center as of last year, and Turkey has been doing a lot to promote it. We issued stamps, we issued commemorative coins, and on the other side, there are a lot of other things written about it. Books that are much controversial, um, and even Turkish authors are trying to uh, capitalize on this, which has absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever. And if you search on the internet, you'll find all kinds of trash that's about the site. Again, absolutely baseless claims. They are rather wild imaginations, and uh, they come up with really crazy stuff. And of course, it is not complete without the ancient aliens. <laughs> So today I'll try to give you a detailed description of the site and why it's important and it's not going to involve any aliens. So the site is uh, very close to the city of Urfa, just uh, 12 kilometers from the center. It's in the northeast of the city of Urfa. Um, <clears throat> this is the hill as it appeared in 1994 when they first came there to excavate. Um, it is in a barren limestone plateau. In the middle of the plateau, there is a hill about 50 meters high on top of the limestone rocks. Um, the site actually has been known for a long time, but it was not excavated. It, it, the first visit to the site was in 1963 by a team from University of Chicago, Robert Braidwood, this gentleman here. He is also an archaeologist with Neolithic uh, expertise and he was looking for a site to excavate. He had worked in Iraq and he has, Robert Braidwood is a famous name in actually Neolithic archaeology. He came up with those theories that are still valid and, you know, Göbekli Tepe actually proves him further. And he was looking for another site to excavate to further his researches. And he, maybe he didn't personally, but people from his team came to the site in 1964. They realized it was a Neolithic hill because it is covered with thousands of flint stones, Neolithic tools. And um, I don't know whether they saw the tips of those T-shaped stones. But the report includes that there were some Byzantine period tombs, so they may have taught those stones as Roman period graves. So they skipped this. Instead, they settled on another hill called Chayomi, further north. And it was a, a very productive site also. Um, so until 1994, nothing has happened. In 1980s, there was a small report, but other than that, uh, nobody visited the site. Uh, that is until Klaus Schmidt came here. Now in 94 when Klaus Schmidt came, he immediately knew the site's importance. Um, there was a solitary tree on it when he came there, this gentleman, Klaus Schmidt, and he had worked in another site called Nevali Chori uh, for about 10 years before here. Uh, Nevali Chori is uh, another Neolithic site. It is in the northwest of Urfa. And uh, they found one building with similar T-shaped stones in that site. So immediately when he saw the stones, he knew the site was a very important place uh, and decided to work in this location. And there was this single tree at the top of the hill with some graves at the bottom dating their Islamic period. Um, this was the landowner, Manu Tildes, <laughs> and uh, they initially gave permission and then they had to pay him uh, for the, uh, you know, the amount of crops that he grew at the site. They compensated his loss. Eventually the site would be acquired. Now it is, the entire site is uh, uh, protected. 
This is the main excavation area, what it looks like almost where they, they found the main circles, and this is the entire hill. Uh, the main excavation area is right here in the southwest. This is the top of the hill, and then they did further excavations here. And this is where the road that comes from the visitor center. In 1917, they start building this protective uh, canopy on top of it. So it was closed for a year for the stations, and today this, it looks like this. This is the canopy they, they, they built. And they also built another one on the current excavation area in the northwest. And this is the road that comes from the visitor uh, center. And there are walkways that you can go around, and they won't let you go down to the circles, but um, this is how it looks now. So, Göbekli Tepe is a Neolithic site, meaning it is Stone Age, way older than uh, what I study. Uh, some of you know I'm a uh, Hittitologist, which is, covers the uh, late Bronze Age, uh, that's second millennium BC. This site is uh, about 8,000 years older than my expertise. So, I'm not a neolithicist, I'm not an archaeologist, I may not be able to answer all your questions, but I studied a little, so hopefully I'll be able to satisfy your questions. By the way, this is an informal talk, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask during the, during the talk, but we'll also have a uh, question-answer session after the talk. Yeah. It was built, and then it's covered with dirt. Yeah, yeah we'll talk about okay, that. Oh, yeah. oh, so they found those circles that are uh, now all famous, and they are all decorated with those monolithic uh, pillars. This, it, the site looks like this before it was covered. And I'm going to start by describing what they found in the southwest corner. This is the main excavation site, and the plan of it is like this. Now, the, all the colors indicate the structures. The, it shows two layers, layer two and layer three. Layer one is unimportant. It is just the dirt that accumulated on it. It is the, the, the uh, thinnest layer. Uh, the layer one is just dirt accumulated after the site was abandoned. So layer two is all these yellow structures. They are from ninth millennium, that is 8000s BC, uh, and the uh, greens are the 10th millennium structures from the uh, 10th millennium BC. Um, all the red marks all the pillars that they found. As you see in the older layer, they are much bigger, but the second layer also has a whole bunch of them. And then those in beige indicates structure that are they are not sure about the date, but uh, they suspect they are between layer two and three, so maybe a transitional period in structures. So let's start with um, lay, uh, circle A. That is the very first place they excavated at the very south. There are about one, two, three, four, five, and then later they found another one, six pillars in the structure. It is not exactly a circle, it is more rectangle oval, and the pillars are not in the center actually, the wall um, touches, touches to those structures. So A, it will go with, but these structures go in the order of date, so very first one they excavated actually, the youngest one, B is a little older, C is older, and D is the oldest. So layer uh, circle A, enclosure A, when they first came, they were able to see the tops of these two pillars. Actually, when they excavate a Neolithic site, typically they start from the top of the hill. But since those stones are already sticking out, they decided to go from the, the southwest corner and uh, they had to pay the landowner for the cost of all the crops to be able to excavate here. And uh, as they start digging, they found this circular wall and the pillars. 
they are numbered in the order they are found. That's why the sixth one here is number 17, because it was found much later. <coughs> and as you see, there is these pillars are parallel to each other here. Their tops were damaged, especially this central pillar, because of farming activity. They tried to uh, break it with a jackhammer. Of course, they were not successful because it goes much deeper than they thought. <coughs> and two central pillars has decorations on them. This is pillar number one. This is a, a net-like snakes, actually. All of those are the heads of the snakes. And at the bottom, there's a ram. In the front of this pillar, there are several snakes, four of them moving down, one moving up. The second pillar, two central pillars, uh, at the top you see an aurochs, which is a very large cattle that's extinct now. It used to roam around this area in those times. And right below it, there's a fox and what looks like a crane. And Klaus Schmidt thinks these are actually this area of the stone had been shaved and recarved, so there may have been a different uh, uh, picture here. Uh, he suggests these were made later. On the side of the second pillar, there's a bull's head, the technical term they call bucranium in Latin. So that's layer A. And by the way, they didn't excavate all the way to the bottom of it. Um, there is a bench that goes around the walls. They stopped around the level of the bench and they didn't reach the, the floor of the uh, circle because they had already found uh, the circle B and they moved on there. I don't know why they don't want to continue later or not. I don't know if they are uh, thinking in, in that regard. So circle B just to the north of it. Um, you see there are two central pillars again, but this time the circular wall is around the structure, doesn't touch the central pillars. And all the other pillars are actually facing towards the center, except one, number five here. They point out such things, I think, I think they think there's some kind of significance about how the pillars were uh, placed. This is how it looked like in 1998, when these are the two central pillars, and then uh, three of them on the side had been uh, uncovered. And eventually, uh, after they removed the dirt that accumulated in the middle, uh, this is the bottom, and, but there's still some material inside. And as it was mentioned, what they are suggesting is that the, the material that filled these circles was actually intentionally filled in. Because of its homogeneous structure, it's made of a bunch of uh, stones and lots of animal bones, they think they intentionally buried these circles. Uh, that has been the view since they started excavations, but actually in recent days, last year or so, they are kind of changing their mind. They think now, there may have been some natural uh, reasons also. If, if there is some uh, intentional burying, but then maybe partially it is also natural. So I was surprised to hear that in, because until today, until recently, they kept saying it was completely buried intentionally. Um, there is this central piece that was found inside the uh, uh, filling material, this bag filling material. It is not in its original place. They had no idea what this was. I will, we will talk about those objects. They found several of those. It, it is not a basin. It's actually, this is open in the middle. It's more like a window. Um, they call them uh, portholes. Well, we'll talk about them here later. This the same, same picture again. In a later time, looks like because of its own weight, it's cracked in the middle. Now, central pillars in uh, in uh, enclosure B has uh, a fox figures that are facing each other. On their other side, there is no no uh, engraving or reliefs. Uh, 
This is pillar nine. Right in front of pillar nine, they found a basin that's installed into the floor of the circle. And they think this is significant because it also has a drainage uh, channel right here. So it may have been used for some sort of um, offerings and stuff. Um, the floor is made of uh, hardened limestone. They call it uh, terrazzo floor. It's made from bits of limestone and then hardened. Um, it is different from the other circles that you will see C and D. C and D actually reaches to the level of a bedrock. The smoothed bedrock uh, makes its uh, its floor. B is a little higher and a little younger. So uh, in this one, the floor is made of terrazzo, which is the type of floor also on all of the layer two buildings. The other uh, pillars in this uh, circle, circle B, enclosure B, uh, don't have too much decoration. On pillar six, on the back side of it, there's a four-legged animal, and then there's a snake on the back side, nothing in the front or sides. On pillar 14, uh, partially uh, obscured what they think may be a backside of the fox again. Um, speaking of those foxes, in, in B, the fox seems to be the dominant animal, and then they think each circle actually has a team of animal. In circle A, they think the team is the snake because it is the dominant animal. In circle B, they call it the fox circle because the foxes are the dominant animal. And in C, it will be the uh, boar, the wild pig. Now C is has three circular walls. There's one, two, and then there's an incomplete third one. It's not totally excavated. Um, and it, all together, it is the largest structure they found. But the central part is only about 15 meter wide. In B, it was about 10 meter. And we'll see D is 20 meters. So D is the oldest and largest. Um, and C, this is at the beginning of the iterations, they found one, two, three walls. And then in the inner three walls have pillars in them. This is what it looks like from the top. The floor is made of natural bedrock. They smoothed the surface and they carved two bases for the central pillars. These are also carved from the natural bedrock. So the entire bedrock was formed to make a floor and uh, two bases with grooves in them to be uh, for to uh, erect the central pillars. Now the central pillars of the enclosure C are damaged. Uh, they were broken, intentionally broken apparently in, uh, in those times. Um, this top piece was restored from what they found in the debris that filled it. And again, this is their thinking. They can tell from the stratigraphy of the filling material that after the circle was intentionally filled, they dug it again in the center in order to reach the central pillars and destroy them. So some kind of iconoclasm, they think. They don't know why it was done. But the center part of it, why it been dug up. The pill, they reached the pillars, they damaged the pillars, and then they buried it again. Um, you know, it's open to speculation why they did that. The central pillar, one of them, has a fox. The other one doesn't have any uh, anything that they can see of on the pieces that they found. But all the others, this is central one, the dominant figure seems to be this boar on pillar 26, there is one in the front. In pillar 12, there is one on the side and several ducks or some other bird at the top in a net-like environment. And at the very bottom, there's a fox partially buried because this is the bench, so they didn't want to excavate any further. They all carved this from stone tools? Yeah. Are they sure? Not metal? No, no this is metal, was not invented back then, so it's Stone Age for sure. <laughs> so their peers back in time were just painting on the wall, nothing similar to this type of structure? 
As far as we know, no. We will talk about it more. So this is the same pillar as you see. It was the, the picture is taken during the excavations. They found the um, boar statue right in front of it, and this is what it looks like. And they found another boar statue partially ahead of the boar, also in circle C, and yet another one again in circle C, a complete boar statue with some couple of. Um, grinding stones and other pillars, pillar 28, another four very rudely carved, another one on the side. And pillar 27 also has a boar, but the more interesting and more pictured uh, item on this pillar is this high relief of a wild cat, something like a panther. And it is almost like a statue, very high relief. And pillar 23 again has some ducks at the top. And uh, while we are on this, uh, it is being debated whether the structures had roofs or not. Initially, they thought there was no roof. Klaus Schmidt suggested there is no roof. But now they are thinking there may have been a roof. They cannot find the uh, definitive evidence for it. But more and more, they are inclining towards having a roof structure because there are no uh, play, nothing that shows they did a water drainage for the circles. They cannot find wooden material to suggest the existence of a roof. But there are, uh, you know, these grooves here. Some of them has holes on the sides, so they cannot decide exactly. But. Uh, Slowly, they are inclining to go towards a roof structure, existence of a roof structure. So, another interesting feature of Circle C is this entryway. In the south of it, there is a walled corridor in two sides of it. Uh, they built a wall, and at the end of it, they found a U shaped stone. It's something like this. It did, that part is broken. But the, on, a, on account of this the other side, they think there was a similar animal at the top of it. And it was located right here. This is a drawing from National Geographic. And uh, they think it was, it, I mean, they found it right here anyway. But they think it formed the entrance for this walkway. Um, this is a zoom in to the same thing. A single piece stone, bottom part is probably buried. And then right behind it, there is this single other piece, what they call a porthole, again that window-like structure that we have seen in circle B, and it, this is that stone, and at the bottom of it there is an upside-down bore again, um, they think it's the original position, so why they carved the bore upside down, it may have again some symbolic importance, maybe um, it's something that signifies death again. Another important thing they found in Circle C is a stairway that leads to it. They didn't find it during the initial excavations, it was found like 2012 or 13. This is a stairway. There are eight steps so far uncovered. So it appears to be leading to the entrance of this uh, Circle C. So that also kind of suggests to them that these circles were not entirely um, above ground when they were built, they, at least partially they were built inside the ground. Um, some of the stones uh, has these double holes they call, it's uh, some kind of groove that goes from here comes up here. Um, they try to use this as to suggest, like, you know, it may have been used to attach some ropes to for the roof structure, but the holes are actually very uh, thin, so you cannot uh, push through a strong rope to, uh, you know, stable the uh, stone. They are thinking these were actually used to hang some objects, maybe some animal hides or other sacred objects, some kind of decoration items, and they find them on several of the pillars, actually. Uh, like on this one, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. 
on uh, enclosure A, there is one right there. So on several pillars, there are those holes. Finally, of these three circles, the last one and oldest one and the best preserved one is So this is the oldest and largest and best preserved. It has the um, highest pillars. As we'll see, the pillars in circle B were about three and a half meter high. In circle C, although they are broken, they estimate them to be about five meters high. And in circle D, they are the highest one is about five and a half meters tall. It does. Okay. Did they say anything about the climate of the line? It was doesn't dry like this. It was much greener than now, and we'll talk about it. There, they, there are lots of lots of animal bones. So they, I mean, this is a hunter-gatherer society we are talking about. It's before agriculture or domestication, and uh, they were able to sustain themselves. And as many of you may have heard. This location so far has no sign of a permanent settlement. Of course, they were living there to, to be able to uh, build these structures, but they think it was a seasonal thing. They come from surrounding areas and um, live there long enough to build them, uh, perhaps seasonally, not year long. And it's seasonality for the seasonality, they offer different things to prove it that the animals that they the animal bones that they find um, mostly adults especially the gazelles which is the main food for them and uh, you know if they were living there year round they would find the younger ones as well uh, they think they hunt them during their seasonal pass let's take this one <laughs> Well, pillars have definitely have a special purpose. I mean, they are decorated with these interesting figures. So, uh, we'll also, you may have heard, they have those human, human shapes, some of them, anthropomorphic shapes. They call them their arms, uh, hands, belts, and stuff. So, they represent something like two central figures and then a surrounding figures. What does it represent? It is being debated, uh, you know, what is this human shaped thing? Is it a god? Is it an ancestor? Is it a dead spirit? You know, they are uh, dead people. 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, the, the, I mean, it's a belief system, but there is no written material. Writing is not invented, so anybody's guess. That's a topic we're waiting for, maybe we can have yeah. a lot of questions. Uh, the circle C, for example, it is altogether the three enclosing walls. Altogether, it's about 30 meters in diameter, but the central part is uh, about 15 meters, the central opening. Uh, circle D is the largest, it is 20 meters. We don't know. It is they call you know they call them temples. They call them meeting place. This is the most uh, in the official website of the excavations. The term they use mostly this was a meeting place. So a meeting place could be anything. It's a communal building. It's a special purpose building. Definitely, it is not a living quarter. There is no sign of a fireplace or anything that indicates they lived in these structures. It has clearly a special meaning to them. So, circle D. Uh, this is during the uh, excavations. You can see uh, how this filling material is a homogeneous made of bunch of rocks and bones, and the, those 
two pillars, as we will see, they have humanoid shapes, anthropomorphic features. Again, they reach the bedrock it's, that was smoothed and carved on the bedrock are those bases for the pillars. And one of them has these seven ducks in front of them, nicely carved. And you can see there is these hands, belt, an animal hide that appears to be used as a loincloth. Um, there is an arm on the side, on both of, both of the central pillars and several others also. And then many pillars, including these, has these grooves in this front of it, only one side. That groove, Klaus Schmidt and others are calling it a stola. Um, like they think it's a piece of garment, also more like a, like a priest wear these long things. They, that's what called a stola. So, but there is no face. So the, this top part apparently represents the head. Um, there is always this V-shaped uh, neck thing, uh, arms and hands and belts, these age figures that you'll see on several other pillars also. And the no face may be also significant. Having no face is intentional, apparently. They did not want to uh, engrave a face on the items or you know, what kind of... Uh, symbolism it has, I don't know, they, is it a god that they don't want to draw a face? We don't, we don't even know if they had a concept of god at that time. Other pillars of enclosure D, uh, pillar 30 has this hole in on the side, one mentioned in front of it. There are several snakes, one, two, three, four, five, and then there's uh, they think a wild donkey, wild ass. And this H, sideways H-shaped thing that has apparently some significance, but they don't know what it is. Pillar 22 has a fox on the side. It's partially buried behind the wall that they are not removing for now. And in front of it is again a snake. Pillar 21, a deer or gazelle and a wild donkey. Pillars 20 and 19, this is a picture taken during the early excavations, but 19 has the snake on it. Nothing appears on 20 at that time, but later when they excavate the front of it, they found again a snake. Appears to be attacking a aurochs, that big cat cattle, and there's a partially damaged fox there. So these snakes, mostly they are shown in this wavy, uh, shape, it, like it uh, indicates uh, action. Uh, they are also now speculating whether these snakes represent poisoned arrows or not, like they are hunting orcs and stuff. It's again uh, speculative. Pillar 33 is one of those highly decorated ones. It has numerous uh, birds on the side. Um, you can see there are ducks, and then some of them appear to have been erased intentionally. You can see signs of one here. At the bottom, there are two long-necked, long-legged birds, most likely cranes, perhaps uh, storks. Um, and then there's these wavy lines, and there are more cranes here, apparently erased. Now. This is, again, a picture taken early in the excavation. The front side of it was not excavated. And Klaus Schmidt thought these are cranes on a lake. These are the waves of the lake. Uh, so he thought it was a very peaceful, <coughs> idyllic scene. He even published an article titled Cranes on the Lake. But when they excavated the front of it, it turned out to be much more dramatic. Those waves are actually snakes. There's a bunch of snake heads here even more on this side that curved to the other side, and more here, more snakes here, above another uh, H-shaped thing right here and here, and you cannot see here, but there's a spider right here. And on the other side, you know, more snakes and the fox. Pillar 19, 
uh, more animals. It's all mostly animals, very few human shapes. Uh, a damaged uh, aurochs here, only legs are visible. Fox, a boar, and three birds above, and a couple of cranes. Pillar 43, one of the famous ones and most talked about pillar probably. Um, richly decorated on three sides, front, back, and this side, nothing on the other side. Um, lots of people use this to come up with crazy ideas. Some read it like a writing. Uh, some say, you know, they see the evidence of a 13,000 year old comet that in, impacted in North America and uh, caused the younger dryas and they are trying to think um, that the Göbekli Tepe this was observed by those people and there is the evidence of it on this. And it absolutely has no scientific base whatsoever. There are Masonic signs, they think these are <laughs> uh, handbags. But most others use it to further their claims that Göbekli Tepe was an astronomical observation site. They think these things represent the uh, zodiac signs. This is also baseless. Um, I mean, we see a vulture here, maybe a baby vulture, some birds, this is a crane, snake, those egg-shaped objects. These, they think, may be huts, uncertain. But the most interesting thing for the archaeologists here is this bottom thing here. This is actually a faceless human, a headless human, this male, actually. They call it etiphallic because of the erect male organ. But it has no head. Um, this object might be the person's head that's being uh, eaten by the vultures. And on account of this, they actually try to make a connection with that kind of dead cult or skull cult, that evidence of which we see from other places like uh, Chatalhuyuk. Uh, Chatalhuyuk has several murals like this that shows humans being dead humans being offered to vultures. This is some kind of a burial system where they don't like a, no, I shouldn't say burial, but uh, no, in order, instead of uh, burying or burning a dead body, they offer them to uh, vultures for the flesh to be eaten and then they collect the bones and preserve them in other ways, like they separate the skull and uh, preserve in some place. So they, they see the signs of a similar belief system in here uh, because you know it existed in Chatalhuyuk and other places. Uh, further evidence to support this comes from other features also found in Circle D. This, this uh, slab was found at the bottom of one of those pillars. It has uh, two wild animals and a vulture and what appears to be a human head again right here nose and eyes and everything. Uh, this is a vulture again, and in talons there's a human head. It's grabbing a probably a dead human skull. Um, and they found skull fragments, uh, three, four of them, that appears to have uh, intentional uh, scrapes on them, uh, purposefully made, and they they put those together and they think they were done in order to, this is just a representation, not a real skull, um, but they, they show how with the um, stone tools, they uh, open grooves on them. They think they were made in order to hang them from, uh, with a rope in some places. Um, so, those four circles are the oldest structures they found, but there are some other circles they found. They like this G, only quarter of it has been opened. Uh, there are a couple of pillars there. Uh, it is more rectangular than circular, and it has smaller T-shaped pillars, so they think it's a little younger, um, but they haven't excavated any further. It is right here. And at the end of this extension, they found yet another circle. They also think this is a little younger, 
but it is not as young as the layer two building. So maybe this and this um, in a transitional period from between layer two and layer three. Uh, this is the F structure, F circle. Two central pillars smaller than the, uh, the original four they found. Again, a terrazzo floor with a bench around the circular pillars. So that was all in here. After the excavations in here, they switched to northwest, those two areas. Uh, this is called Northwest Mount, this is called Northwest Depression. Uh, in the depression, they found yet another very old circle. This is called H, they go by the order they found. One central pillar here, and pieces of another pillar right here, and then several surrounding pillars in that circle. Top part is damaged, appears to be intentional, and uh, they think there is something like what happened in circle C also took place in here. This was also a bad field, and uh, I'll show you the picture for it. They, they dug it again in the center of it to reach the central pillars and they damaged them. So again, some kind of iconoclasm. I don't know why they do such an action. The side pillar, this is not a relief, instead they engraved it, there is a horned animal, perhaps a aurochs again, those large kettles. Its tongue is sticking out, its legs are flexed, and there's a smaller one right below it. So they think it's either a dying or dead animal, uh, whatever that means, like quite, quite the to the picture of it, it may have again a symbolic meaning. On pillar 69, a wild cat. Pillar 57, nothing on the sides, but on the front, there are the heads of two snakes and a circular object in the middle, perhaps a bull's head. Because of this, they on pillar 56, again, two snakes and a crane, a bull's head on the front side, but the uh, left side has lots of decorations. There are actually 55 animals here. The central figure is this vulture, and it is the only one facing towards the center of the circle. All the other animals are facing outside, with the exception of this snake there. Uh, lots of snakes, ducks, cranes, some four-legged animals, wild cats probably, and maybe a rabbit right there. Can you can you go back to the new uh -huh. Go back to that uh, the the this and uh, the male with the genital that shows male. Male the headless man. Yeah, yeah. Well, but before before couple more. Uh, pillar forty three. You mean? Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 please. Yeah. Okay. It looks like male and having a. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an erect organ. organ. The same thing like in Greek mythology, but this time the lady was uh, Leda and Swan, which according to Greek mythology, uh, Helen of Troy born. Almost similar position, but except male. And female, probably geese or duck, or the other one is cutting. It could be a related. No, no. It's because it's 10,000 years apart. I mean, Some pictures it's really impossible to prove yeah. such a thing. And uh, I mean, the transition of. In order to prove such a thing, then you would have to traces of the same story in the following civilizations to establish a connection. Otherwise, it's. Uh, very difficult. <laughs> but you know, you know um, the locals on the hill, they think they're like, uh, they, they, they come there and they find those little... Yeah, on that wish tree at the top of the hill. They some holiness on those hills. 
But those, I mean, this is a hill that is visible from a long distance. It is the highest hill in a very wide area. And a tree being on top of it, such holy sacred places are in existence all over Anatolia. So whenever you find a high spot or a single tree. Do you think that that tree and two uh, great? So Why much time here? has passed, like the, the site was in abandoned in 8000 BC. Nobody oh. lived there mm -hmm. since then. So no I, connection at all. I don't, I personally don't believe anything. You never know. <laughs> the only thing is, some of the animals are very archaic, very primitive. Being. They are primitive. Some of very, very like a mother, such as those bees or bugs, as a detail. Yeah, their anatomical features are not proper. Either. Some has legs like humans, or some of them has legs uh, uh, folded forward as if they are sitting down like a human, which is not possible for a bird. But then they speculate things like a human wearing a bird uh, cloth to do some kind of ritualistic dance or something, because such things yeah. they know from Chatalvik, which yes. is a little younger than here. So we were, okay, they, okay, age we were talking about. Um, intentionally dug and damaged central pillars, Aura, pillar 56, Cat, let's see, that's this. Of course, all of these, they clearly tell some sort of story, but we don't know what. I mean, it's, uh, they are trying to tell something, otherwise they wouldn't go into trouble of establishing such elaborate uh, designs, but it's, you know, we don't know what it is. Here, I just want to point out how it is different color over here and here. This is the central part. That's it, how they were able to tell it was dug up again later time. And uh, probably at that time, they, they damaged the central pillars. Uh, another feature in this is this corner. They were actually digging to establish that roof structure for the new excavation area that you have seen in one of the pictures. Uh, they were looking for a place to put one of the legs of the roof and they reached the um, bedrock at the bottom of it and they realized this is the bedrock and right there there's this channel intentionally carved. It's about 30 centimeters wide, 30 centimeters deep. It's clearly a water channel, so they are channeling water from here to where. They have to excavate a very large area to find out what's going on there, but there is something uh, in, in intentionally done. Uh, enclosure E is the last circle I'll talk about. This is actually right here, and there is not much left of it. How many of you have been there? Okay, that is when you first walk there, this is the first place you'll see. It is right there. Uh, it is actually the leftovers of a circle right there. This is the bedrock. It is, you can see there are remains of two bases and places where they put the pillars. Uh, nothing of the upper structure has been left. It's all cleaned up in ancient times. So there was a circle here, but it was all gone. Uh, this is actually one of the first places they uh, excavated. And when they first found this, they didn't know what to make of it until they dug up circle C and D, and then they know this was also a circle. Uh, it's not as high as the ones in uh, circle C or D, but clearly same purpose. Just to the north of it, there are two large holes, clearly for uh, water collection. One of them has stairs in them. And all these little, what they call cup holes, um, there are a whole bunch of them all over the place, like you can see here and there too. Um, the purpose of it is unclear in some cases, like I know from Hittite examples, many, many millennia later, they are marks of offerings, but here they think maybe they are the um, basis for wooden beams. In that particular section, I'm, I tend to think this is an attempt to open a third hole, 
they actually make these little holes with some whatever tools and then they break the between walls and slowly they make it deeper i think i read about it somewhere but i cannot find so i don't know this is the northwest mount uh, the northernmost part of the excavations as you can see here when they first open those there are a bunch of wall structures here these are all layer two buildings but not much in here uh, but they knew they were there was something below there so they continued digging and then eventually they found the top of a t-shaped uh, uh, pillar and it is a giant one again uh, but they stopped excavations here at this point and focused on where they found the circle age i don't know when they will continue digging here but it, it, it is at this point right now, so there are more circles there. Another find from that area is this huge slab. It is about three meters wide, three meters high. It is one of those portholes. This time it has two windows, two openings on it. They found many of those type of stones, mostly broken. Few of them are complete like this one and uh, the, you know, beautiful thing about this, it has these animal uh, carvings on them, most almost like a statue, high reliefs, uh, and they represent different animals: a wild cat, a ram, a bull, and then and the snake on right here, a reptile. Um, they didn't know this is the one they found in enclosure B. They were thinking, you know, is this a some sort of door that's uh, used to enter the structure, maybe somewhere near the roof, because they didn't find any one of them in the original location. Uh, very first one they found, they, they called them portable pillar bases, because they thought these were actually bases for to erect the pillars on top, but clearly the opening is too wide. Uh, and when they found some of the central pillars, they realized they are not pillar bases. Uh, so they could start calling them portholes. Eventually, just a few years ago, right north of uh, Circle B, they found, they did a deeper excavation and they found this piece. And it is in its original location. Um, it's this. Again, a porthole, a bit smaller, but it's again also decorated with animal figures. So it, it is uh, uh, on the wall and uh, this entrance leads nowhere. So maybe it is some kind of a niche for some sacred objects. Um, so they think the others were also fallen down from the walls that existed before. Um, layer two buildings, we didn't talk much. It's because in comparison to layer three, these are less uh, significant but if they had not found these layer two buildings themselves would be a great importance because there is nothing like Göbekli Tepe in any other Neolithic sites you can tell that the difference between the layer two and layer three is that all of the layer two buildings are rectangular uh, not circular but they also have pillars all of those little red dots are also pillars but their pillars are smaller, doesn't exceed two meters, um, and they have fewer decorations. This is a layer two building, another layer two building, you can see how clearly rectangular, and bunch of uh, pillars. Some of those have those human shaped, like hands and the, the central stola, um, animal carvings, wild cats, and this is the this is a slab they found on the floor this is the only female figure they found in Gebekli Tepe everything else all the animals are male wherever there's a human shape it is also male uh, so it's a male dominant culture clearly they didn't find any even a figurines because like most other neolithic sites they can find clay figurines of females no such thing in here. This is the only female figure, and it is an uh, engraving on the, uh, that's done much later. Numerous uh, sculptures. This is a totem pole carved from a single piece of rock, about two meters high. It's uh, 
conglomerate of different creatures and humans. You can see arms uh, holding a broken object, other, another pair of arms, uh, snakes on the sides, eating remains of a bull at the top. I can't tell. Some parts of it are, are broken, but uh, I mean, they don't know what else to call it. It looks like a totem pole. Numerous structures, some are humans, all male, some animals. We have seen some of those before. A cat holding a human head. Uh, many human heads, most of them appear to have been broken intentionally from uh, one's existing bodies. And some, some of those circles, these are about half a meter wide. They don't know the purpose of it. Several of them have been found. All of those finds, you can see them in Urfa Museum that was built a few years ago. And if you go there, you'll also see a replica of Circle D. Uh, of course, it's not active original, but at least they let you walk around here and take pictures. And the date. We already mentioned it dates to 10th millennium, how they are able to tell this. Uh, for one thing, they compare it with other Neolithic sites, but for definitive evidence, they had to do carbon-14 dating, and the, the, they use material from the plaster that was applied on the walls. You can see the remains of some plaster on these walls. This is from Circle D, and the plaster includes some organic material. Uh, they found thousands of animal bones in the circles, but uh, they cannot use the animal bones because they were backfilled later, so it wouldn't give an accurate date, but the plaster from the walls itself gives a correct date. This shows all the locations where they took the samples, and these are uncalibrated dates. When they calibrate them, the oldest structures date to 10th millennium. And if you want to put it on a scale, we are here in 2019. That's 2500 BC is the Great Pyramid. The oldest level of Stonehenge is 3000 BC. The writing was invented, the earliest form of writing, to 2500 BC. Metal tools don't, didn't come into use until 5000 BC, so they are definitely in way back in Stonehenge, Stone, uh, Stonehenge. Chataluik, they much talked about the world's first village, as they called it, which is in Koina. Uh, the earliest level of it dates to 7500 BC. The Tower of Jericho, this used to be called the earliest known uh, monumental item dates to 8,000 BC and Göbekli Tepe outdated by 1,500 years. Where is the Jericho? Jericho is in, uh, in Israel today. Yeah. So the, I, I watched something yesterday to do homework <laughs> in really bullshit resources like, you know, YouTube, whatever. Uh, but many of, the, many of the things that you can find on the internet, Caucasian race, Left the uh, originated from the Caucasian mountain around uh, 6500 BC. Now, if you look at this, uh, Caucasian I believe really, like Caucasians, like Armenoids, like Kittites, the Indo Europeans, what they call uh, there's a consensus among the Western scientists that they, they, they there is no consensus on the origin of but Caucasian the term, race. But the term is coined, that, that's the thing, the term is coined. Yeah, that's a very early term. That's, they thought it's somewhere from there, and that's why they used that term. But there's but absolutely no consensus on that. Yeah, that's what I realized. It's wrong, because if the, many, of the, many of the videos they show, like, not real academic resources, but I believe those people collected from different academic resources, they show that, like, for instance, the way that Caucasian people, like, almost concentrated in the Caucasus mountain and spread it all around the world, like, you know, gloriously. It like, doesn't you know, make any sense because Caucasian ma sense. mountains is not a, a place to live easily. It's, uh, you know. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Maybe they can originate their European heritage to those mountains, but many of the people who 
or is known to a common language, grammatic structure like Semitic people, Europeans, what they call as Indo-Europeans. Uh, it's much more complicated immigration laws, so you cannot really, like after seeing this presentation and seeing this timeline, it's clear to me that uh, I think like uh, there's like a Eurocentric like point of view about generalizing like different type of peoples of the world under one umbrella, especially looking at their skin color. Just just my just my takeaway from this. Okay, moving on. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> so Gyurveji Tepe uh, was abandoned around 8000 BC. They lived there about, they didn't live there, but it remained in existence for about 1500 years. And uh, in two phases, if we look at it, layer three covers about from 9500 to 88 BC, and then layer two uh, covers the remaining 800 years, um, <coughs> so colors match that. Is it because of the three gods like, the, the, uh, the cover, that's why they built layer two later? No, it is not a, like a, you know, they buried the entire layer three and then start building layer two. It is a slowly evolving process. Like they built structure B and then they abandoned structure D, they start building structure C. We don't, uh, we don't know how much time is in between them. They, there's like structure D is oldest, roughly 9,500. C is maybe a few hundred years later. Uh, that is around 9,200. But at what point they filled up D and started using C? Or were they both in use at the same time? Uh, we are not sure about this, but it's definitely they were not all backfilled at the same time. Slowly, they abandoned one, built another one, abandoned one, Could built another be one. Could it be the national way? Could it be the like earthquake, this and that? They they think they are intentionally filled. They're, they now they are leaning towards some material filling them up uh, naturally. Perhaps they abandoned them, and then some debris started falling in them. And then they realized it's not no longer in use, and they filled it for more further or something. So, uh, could it be like different groups? They all built their own thing. It is a possibility because you know those teams in each circle, yeah. snake yeah. or fox or could what they like may represent plants? the tribes, yeah, or tribe. the most sacred animal of that group of people. So that is something that they debate on. That's a possibility. They, you know, there's no evidence to prove anything. Yeah, how would you prove? How, how far, how far they are from each other? The circles, the right next to each other. Right they next are, to each other. They are like a few meters. Yeah. Some almost touching each other. Yeah, they, yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's hard to say they are built different time because. Yeah. They're all together. I mean, they clearly know the existence yeah. of others. Right. In fact, the, there is they evidence that they dug up them. and destroyed the pillars of the other one. Maybe yeah. they didn't like that tribe or they, they want to the destroy tribe. their foxes and stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I know, it's interesting yeah. how close they are. They started to build and, and dig and whatever, but where did they get the pillars from that? We are coming to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gyobek <laughs> Tepe is right here. This shows all the pre pottery Neolithic age, so 10,000 millennium settlements. Now, we know Gyobek Tepe doesn't have a settlement, but all the others does. Yeah. So, what Klaus Schmidt and others were suggesting, these were people who were living around this area, and they were coming here for this you know, sacred purpose and building these structures. So. People at this time, they were already living in different, like we can't call them cities, they are more like villages or semi-sedentary villages. These people are uh, hunter-gatherers, they are not doing agriculture, agriculture is not invented and they are just killing animals or collecting food that's around. How do we know they are not in between 1996 and 2001? They collected 40,000 bone samples from what they dug up. And that tells them what they ate. Most of it was gazelles, 
almost a quarter was those large cattle and the rest was all kinds of other animals and all of them are wild. From the bones they are able to tell whether it's an, an animal is wild or tamed and there is no indication of any domestication. They are also finding now uh, plant remains and those are still being analyzed. The result of it has not been published, but there is um, the ancestors of wheat, emmer, and einkorn, and pistachio, and almonds, but all the wild varieties, nothing domesticated. And this shows the map of uh, ninth millennium settlements. As you can see, they are distributed around this area. It is like a uh, crescent. That's what they call fertile crescent. And Klaus Schmidt even says this is the golden triangle of yeah. fertile crescent because origins of all of the oldest ones go here. This is the area eventually where agriculture will start. The first domestication of the wheat, barley, and several other uh, start from this area and the animals as well. Now, another reason they believe there was no settlement in Göbekli Tepe is that there is no water in Göbekli Tepe. The nearest water source is five kilometers away, so it could be very difficult to sustain a living, permanent living there. But of course, they work there, and all these working groups would need water. So and that's why they think they utilized systems like these. They also found systems in the, in the plateau surrounding it, like those here. So there were, you know, they, they collected their own water and then we found those channels in the bedrock. So they don't know what that will reveal later on. In layer two buildings, as well as in some in layer three, they found those stone cups. This is also pre-pottery. There is no pottery. They didn't do map pottery. Everything is made of stone. <laughs> and analysis on these reveals some residue that they think they made beer from wild plants. Yeah. In fact, that actually strengthens the strengthens Robert Braidwood idea that wheat, the ancestors of wheat, was domesticated for the purpose of beer, not for bread. <laughs> Which actually, I mean, at first time they all laughed, it was in 1953, they came up with this theory, and it is becoming more stronger. I think they really domesticated for, for beer before bread. How did they live? Maybe they just preserve water, right? Well, they may have been used for water, but they can. They analyzed the residue around it, like the, the uh, carbon something something, I forgot the technical terms that forms when they uh, make beer in such uh, containers. Final results of it has not been published yet, but it is something they strongly believe now. Why would they make beer? Well, they must have. You know, clearly there were big feasts. You, you, they have you have seen a bunch of animal balls. So all these working groups, they had feasts to feed them. And beer was part of those celebrities. They, you know, they enjoyed beer. <laughs> well, no, but they might have discovered it by just it ferments. Yeah, yeah but how they, they how they invented it? Yeah, you know, they threw some barley in water and forgot there. You know, it fermented it's somehow, and yeah, it's not by so accident yeah. they discovered. Yeah. Is there evidence of fire? Fire? Not that I heard of. Uh, there are char I mean, you mean like they burn animals? Yeah, there are lots of charcoal they find. And so where did that come from? The wood? I mean, uh, the, the area was wooded. Was wooded back then. Yeah, time. lots of animals. So it was definitely wooded at that time. I think you, you cannot preserve water for long. Even in our lab, in modern times, chlorinated water, when we do HPLC, like we start seeing the the yeah, that's why they don't think there was a permanent year-round settlement there. So they came there seasonally. Maybe they choose oh, seasons okay. that they would have more rain. So how they built them? Where did yeah. the stone come? It, this is a, again drawing from National Geographic published some years ago. It's incorrect. Now we know this is the 
this is C, V not V is built before C, so. <laughs> this plateau is all limestone, and they found a bunch of quarries right around here, like this one here, and this one here. This is a seven meter tall pillar that's formed but not removed. It would have been even taller than the tallest ones they found there. Um, and even Roman time, it was quarried for stones. There are some, well, you can see the hill right there. And they are not far, a few hundred uh, yards from the hill, a few hundred meters. Uh, and they experimented with this in elsewhere, not here. Carving these stones and carrying them, at, you know, a few hundred meters. It doesn't take a lot of people. Some road things like 500 people and stuff. No, you get 20, 30 people, you can still move those stones. They are, the largest ones they found are 10, 15 tons. It's really not that hard. How do they carve them? Limestone, the one in Göbekli Tepe is a type of hard limestone, but even the hardest limestone can be easily cut with flint and obsidian. They found literally thousands of these in the hills. Uh, it's covered everywhere. Even when you go and walk around, you'll see those. My brother picked up a few of them already. They were letting people pick them up because there were so many of them. We recently, they banned it now because they are everywhere. When you walk, you'll see bone fragments, something like this. Uh, they use millions of them, maybe, not thousands. Filins? Flints come from surrounding valleys. Göbekli Tepe itself doesn't have flint, but the surrounding valleys does. So they, they come from elsewhere. And they did an experiment with carving an animal. It just took a few hours to do this, not much. And the museum has demonstration of more than a tea stone there. Now, tea stones are not unique to Göbekli Tepe either. The Göbekli Tepe has the largest examples, and it may be central to all the other sites, but this marks all the other sites that, that they found T-shaped stones. They did not, some of them were found long ago, they just didn't realize their significance. Uh, Nevalichori is one of them. It's where Klaus Schmidt had uh, excavated before he came to Göbekli Tepe. And the one he found in Nevalichori, this is the temple in Nevalichori, a rectangular building, just like the layer two buildings in Göbekli Tepe. And it is contemporary with the uh, layer two of Göbekli Tepe in the ninth millennium. It was one of the last places they dug up in, Göbek, in Nevalichori uh, because this stone was sticking up and they were thinking again, this, this cannot be ne Neolithic. So they saved it for the last season and when they carved, they found this structure, but the entire, entire Nevalichori has a single uh, this, uh, special purpose building. They found only one. Göbekli Tepe has hundreds of them. This is what it looked like probably. Uh, and Nevalichori was inundated by the walls of uh, the waters of Atatürk Dam, it's under the lake now. But before they, uh, it was buried, they removed all the stones and they now it's in Urfa Museum. So you can see that building, Nevalichori building in Urfa Museum also. And several other sites, none of them are excavated, but Karahan Tepe is one of the important ones, several T-shaped uh, stones there. All of them are smaller, like the layer two buildings. So this also probably from ninth millennium. They also found the quarry there where they carved the T-shaped stones. Kurt Tepesi, it's another one. Kojenizan, this is buried in the ground, just top is sticking up. This is from Sefer Tepe, Tarshi Tepe, Harbet Suan. In Harbet Suan, they even found one with the humanoid features, the hands and the uh, the groove, the, what they call stola. This is the Nevalichori example with the human shape, arms, hands, the V-shaped neck. And they found this in Kilisik. This is somewhere in Adiyaman. It is a bit later example, but 
It has more human-like features. The arms are shaped a little differently, but the head is somewhat circular and it may have a nose, so more facial features. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna put the alien picture there to compare, but you know, this this kind of shapes give give people ideas, and then they come up with all this you know, well, crazy nice stuff. Camera. It could be a good camera. And this this is also in the museum now. And they compare it with this one. From they found this in Urfa. Uh, this one has a very clear human shape. It has a complete head. The V-shaped neck, same arm structure coming in front. So all of those clearly represent a human shape. The T, T pillars. They are certain about it. But what kind of human? Does it? Is it a god? Is it a dead ancestor? You know, those are questions that we are not able to answer. So what is Göbekli Tepe? They call them temples. They call them cult places communal buildings, special purpose buildings, or more commonly used term now, a meeting place. So it is clearly a, not a living place. It is a special purpose place built by hunter-gatherer human groups. Neolithic revolution is a term that was invented in uh, early 20th century by a uh, scholar named Gordon Child, an archaeologist. Uh, in England. He's Australian, but lived all his life in England. Just went back to Australia to commit suicide. <coughs> Neolithic Revolution describes that sometime in the Neolithic period, hunter-gatherer humans switched to permanent settlements and they started agriculture and domestication. They were even debating early on whether the settlement started first or agriculture started first and one led to another. We know today for sure, even before Göbekli Tepe, humans are settled first and agriculture started afterwards. Oops. Question is why? Why did humans settle? Now, why? Ask why. <laughs> yeah, they. Now, why they are asking why? Because hunter-gatherer lifestyle is much easier than settled lifestyle. That's all anthropologists agree agree on this now. Why would a hunter-gatherer abandon his lifestyle and go living in a city? Wikipedia says agriculture started no. in that in 9500. Nine, 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 now we know, don't believe Wikipedia. <laughs> 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 Settlements came first. I will find the secondary resource. Yeah, I, I found so many wrong things in Wikipedia. Right. No. Yeah, they, yeah, I mean, they give good ideas sometimes, but, uh, but not there. But is there a coincidence around that time? You even said it in a few, a few slides before. What did agriculture I say? Agriculture started around that time. No, agriculture started later. I said yeah. they were debating whether settlements came first or agriculture came first, but we know now agriculture came after the settlements. Yeah. Right. Did they have like more access to hunting animals and stuff? Yes, that's yeah, I mean there is abundant animal and plant life. So in fact like when the Europeans first arrived in Australia, Australian Aboriginals were living as a hunter-gatherer society. They knew how to plant seeds, they have the knowledge of agriculture, but they don't do it. They ask them, why do you not do farming? He says, why would I? I mean, there is food on the tree, if I'm hungry, I go pick it up. It is just much easier. It is. Agriculture life is much more difficult time-consuming, energy-consuming life than hunter-gatherer life. Today, it's not, because we cannot sustain that many people without agriculture, but back then it was. So they asked, and they came up with a bunch of uh, theories why humans switch to settled life. It's Some like of them decide, yeah, environmental changes forced it, like mm -hmm. it was 
that Gordon Child, who came up with the Neolithic Revolution idea, he said there was a, a worldwide climatic event, a drought that forced people to go near water sources, uh, you know, crowd their own water sources, settle them, and then eventually they formed uh, agriculture to sustain those number of people. And that was uh, rejected based on evidence that there was no such uh, drastic climatic changes. A bunch of others came up with theories that suggest demographic changes, that human population uh, that increased rapidly and they had to spread around, they couldn't find enough animals and stuff. So they cite this as the evidence for switching to a settled life and agriculture and domestication. And then there are a few others who said, no, it happened because of sociocultural reasons. Human changes in human behavior and thinking way. And uh, few scholars came up with those and they were ridiculed at the time, criticized heavily. But what Göbekli Tepe does, it proves that that was a cultural change. So the previous common view was that hunter-gatherers, for whatever the reason, became permanent settlements. They lived, started living in permanent settlements. And only after that, the agriculture, domestication, and the complex social structures that were necessary to sustain that life uh, appeared. Complex social structures meaning hierarchy, administration, specialization, and religion in its broadest term, or mysticism or whatever. Because they could not imagine a hunter-gatherer societies were able to have such complex uh, structure that um, hierarchies, etc. Uh, but what Göbekli Tepe and other sites now prove that hunter-gatherers did have a very complex social structure that they were able to build these monumental buildings, it proves some kind of belief system. And I should emphasize, Göbekli Tepe is not alone in this. There are several other sites that was already telling this, but we didn't want to believe, because there was not the, like, Neolithic had one building. Even before that, when Robert Braidwood uh, excavated in Chayuni, he found buildings that were clearly not um, living quarters, special purpose buildings. Uh, but the, you know, the anthropologists, archaeologists, they were not willing to admit it, despite some of those theories. Uh, what Göbekli Tepe did, it was a poke in the eye, like, here you go, if you, you know, believe in that, uh, Navali Chori or Chayami, we have the definite proof here that we are able to build structures like this, we have co complex uh, social stock societies. Maybe the population grow and they try to keep territorial areas, that's why they said That goes to demographic theory, but so they cannot prove it, they cannot uh, I mean, prove it's a, it's a really by population. Area, yeah. And a lot of people live there. But they, yeah, I mean, there would be evidence of a big population, so... Well, look what they built, though. Yeah. There might be a lot of people there. <laughs> but that's because of a, uh, the way of uh, change in their thinking, they say. Now. Yes, I'm... All of this, all the dates and everything I'm talking about belongs to Middle East and more particularly this northern Mesopotamia. Because agriculture started in seven, eight different places in the world, but, uh, separate from each other. Earliest Middle East. Yeah, the earliest is in here. Right. We have the receipts also, the Barbie, or part, or Barbie and uh, wheat receipts, uh, selling receipts by Sumerians, so they have tablets. Yeah, but yeah much, much, much later, later. Yeah. Much later. Yeah. 5000 BC, something like that. Sumerians, like, third millennium. Right. Yeah. And this isn't related to what you're discussing, but the ropes that they used, did they weed them? Did they... Yeah, it was, they don't have the evidence here, yeah. but they clearly had, you had the knowledge of ropes, yeah, to because they have them from Chatalhuyuk, they found by luck. Uh, 
some remains of some ropes, so they use plant material to yes. build them and make ropes. Now, what, what more to come from Göbekli Tepe? They did radar scans, uh, ground penetrating radar. They had not done it when they were excavating here, but once they found this, they start digging, I mean, doing a, a ground penetration radar net. And this is the entire hill. You see there are a yeah. whole bunch of other structures laying down there. Um, but compare this with the map now. Are they going to work on them? Right here, yeah. they planted the orchard, and right here they planted the orchard. And uh, I was trying to find the information why they planted the orchards. I'm guessing why they did. No, Just they won't think. yes. They don't want to excavate the entire site. Yeah. It's, they want to leave it for future generations because archaeology, the techniques improve every year. They find some new stuff. Klaus Schmidt had already said that we are not going to dig the entire place uh, because, you know, in the future there will be more techniques available to find better results. So I'm guessing on purpose they are not going to excavate in these two areas, but they are focusing here. Um, you see, there's this line that goes right here. And they did some geoelectric readings to get some profile readings. I'll show you the map of the result of this. This is the geoelectric reading of that structure there. Again, there is this channel-like line there. Which line? This is the profile of the fifth? No, yeah, number four. Oh, four. Of this. Okay. Oh, that's a valley. There is, this is the bedrock, and right in the middle of bedrock, there is this huge channel. This is 15 meters wide, 8 meters deep, deep, and it is artificial that goes through there. So they carved a huge, it's not a channel, it is a, like a walkway, like a street kind of thing. So I'm really curious what's going to come out of, <laughs> come out of this place. Klaus Schmidt, when he came to the site, he said, the moment I saw the site, I knew I would spend the rest of my life here. But I don't know if he made a wish in that wish to me, but his wish came true, you know, he died in 2014. So technically he spent the rest of his life there. The wish tree is still there, so if you go there, <laughs> you yeah, make a wish. <laughs> People are hanging in the stomach. So why Klaus Schmidt, was he or was it his own thing? Like, how did this whole thing start? He works in German Archaeological Institute. He was not the head excavator in knowledge, or he was an assistant. Uh, but he was given the right to continue excavations in Southeast. They were working in a bigger project uh, of Neolithic project. So they needed a site to uh, do further research, German Archaeological Institute. So he was given to the right to go search a place and choose. So, Are the Turkish government? Yeah, German Archaeological Institute works hand in hand with the Turkish government, so they give you permission. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>
Yeah, it is for exchange of culture, whatever they know, goods or information or different things. It's, uh, it is, you know, in the map it shows it's right in the middle of all those places that has T-shaped stones. So it may have been a, a cultural center for a bunch of different groups. It was what? Bar. Bar. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, once they had the knowledge of how to make beer, they would make it everywhere. So. Uh, I don't know. It's not so far. It's, it's near. Near to the Greek style. What language would it be?